What is it like waking up from a coma? Today I'm going to share that with you. Hi, I'm Amanda Vandergulik from CleverDoughKids.com where I help entrepreneurs find ways to create an income from themselves doing something they love and teaching those concepts to their children, raising money smart kids. I'm working on a series of videos that explains what it was like when I was in a coma and nearly didn't survive acute respiratory distress syndrome, but luckily did. So what is it like waking up from a coma? It's really bizarre. When you wake up, you're not just suddenly awake. As the medication gets taken off, because I was in an induced coma, a medically induced coma. So as the medication slowly got taken away, my brain did really weird things, really strange things. And there was a lot of things I had to learn again. You see what happened, and I've got a video for you explaining exactly what it's like being in a coma, which you can see in my playlist over here. A very short scenario, I ended up with double lung pneumonia and I got transported to a hospital with an ICU and in order to do so, they had to put me in an induced coma and it was supposed to be for just a couple of days, but it ended up being for three weeks and nearly not making it because I developed ARDS, which is when your lungs want to just give out and they cannot support themselves any longer. So what it was like waking up. So as the medication started to come off, my brain went from this horrible nightmare state that I had been dreaming while in the coma and slowly started connecting with what was actually happening in reality. But my brain didn't know the difference. So I would literally have conversations with people in the real world, but our conversations were not the same. I remember my dad once saying, oh, but you said such and such. And I'm like, yes, but at the time, I didn't know you were talking about this thing. I was talking about this thing. So yes, I may have answered you, but in my mind, I was in a different place. And what you were saying never registered into me. What you were saying was simply what I thought you were saying. One of the beautiful things about this is that I got a wonderful insight into what it is like for someone who struggles with mental health, where they see something that is not actually present, but how real it really is to that person. And how by saying to that person, oh, don't worry, that thing isn't real, actually just adds more anxiety because now we're afraid that you don't see this, this horrible thing that we clearly see. So besides coming out of the ICU psychosis, when your brain has to start functioning again without the medications, and it's like you're being detoxified in your brain. You go from crazy dreams to slowly reality. And it's actually, I remember the days so clearly when I was able to actually sit there and look at my, my partner and she would say, okay, that one is real. And I would put it in my real folder in my mind. No, that one didn't happen. Okay, so I put that in my, that was the dream world folder. And I was actually starting to able to piece together which pieces were reality and which pieces had been my nightmare. Besides the mental side of coming out of an induced coma, there is the physical implications. Because I was in a coma for three weeks, everything in my body had atrophied which means muscles had completely relaxed and they didn't have the ability to constrict the way a muscle needs to constrict in order to move your body. I had no strength, completely weak. The most I could do was just barely lift my arms and move my arms a little bit. And that was a struggle. I could not communicate. My brain, as it slowly started shifting from nightmare state to reality, was able to function, thank goodness. Although my memory took a really hard hit and I still struggle with that to this day. My processing speeds are dramatically reduced to what they used to be. I can no longer do 
what I did before at the speed in which I did it both mentally but also physically, especially physically. Besides the paranoia and the nightmares, the physical side, when I woke up, I had this tube in my mouth. It was helping me breathe, but I didn't realize that was what it was doing. I wanted to get it out. So I was fumbling and struggling and I managed to actually unclip it a few times. Luckily, my partner was there and stopped me <laughs> or else that could not have been a good outcome. But I was in the state of, of not knowing what was going on. I was strapped down because during my coma, I had actually tried to escape my bed and somehow had actually managed to get out of my bed, even though I was strapped down and hit my head on the concrete floor. That also went into my dreams. If you'd like to hear what the dreams were like in the coma, I've got a video for that in my playlist as well. It's really interesting how your brain takes every experience of your life and all of your fears and all of your loves and mushes them together in the most horrendous way. Now I'm not saying this happens for everyone who is in a coma, but for me that was the situation. Every possible fear I'd ever had, every negative experience I'd ever experienced came together in this overwhelming nightmare of a dream. So what other physical implications did I have? Well, I couldn't speak. I couldn't communicate. So my mom wrote out the alphabet on a piece of paper thinking maybe I could just point to the letters. I thought internally this was a great idea. I was going to be able to communicate because I had to warn them. I was still in this paranoia state. I had to warn them of these horrible things which really weren't there, but I had to warn them and I couldn't communicate. So I started pointing at the letters, but my hand-eye coordination, my, my brain to hand functioning wasn't working. I would want to spell the word dog, but my hand would not go to D-O-G. It insisted on going to C-A-T. Like, so my words made no sense. We couldn't communicate. So I was still not able to communicate. So it took a little while, a couple of days for slowly pieces to come back together and to be able to do that. And that was a huge struggle. It was physically exhausting as well, because again, my lungs had been through the ringer, as well as my body not getting the oxygen it needed. I had things like, as I got stronger, I had to do what they call spidering. It's just moving yourself around your bed to start building up your muscles. That was tremendously difficult. It hurt. I had no strength. I tried to lift myself up and I couldn't. Come on, you can do it. But I couldn't. And it wasn't for lack of trying because I was trying. When I finally was able to lift my leg off the bed for the first time, I did not expect what happened. I lifted my leg off the bed and my muscles stayed on the bed. And it was just the bone and it terrified me. I thought I would never, ever get my muscle back. Again, this was just my new life. And it looked like I was about 130 years old and only the bone would move and the muscle sagged. And it was terrifying. It's terrifying to be in that bad of a state physically. You don't understand how you can possibly ever come back from that. When I did get my voice back, I couldn't sing. I'd never not been able to sing. And I never realized how important it was to me for, for my health, for my mental health, to be able to sing. It hit me so deeply. This part of me that helped me cope when I was happy, helped me cope when I was sad, I was no longer able to do. And that's really sad. I spent a lot of time doing musical theater and to not be able to just jump on stage and dance and sing and act, that was really hard to accept. One of the very first things I was determined to do after I woke up and communicated, oh, I wanted water. I wanted water so bad and I wasn't allowed to have it because of course they were afraid my lungs would asphyxiate. In other words, I would choke and so I wasn't allowed water but I'm somebody who drinks water all day long. I have it beside me all day long. I drink water, I have my smoothies. I'm always drinking fluids. 
always, you know, a cup of tea. And here I'd gone three weeks on just an IV. And my partner, bless her soul, was like, oh, don't worry, like, you're hydrated. They would make sure you're hydrated. And I'm like, okay, I might be hydrated for a normal person, but for me, I am so dehydrated, my brain is not working. And the first time I was able to drink, I could actually feel the neurons in my head connecting and ideas making sense again. It's incredible. I had a really lovely nurse who gave me ice chips because I wasn't allowed to drink. Oh, they were the most heavenly thing I had ever had. And the other thing I was dying for more than anything in the world were my children. I ached for them. I desperately wanted to see them. I wanted to see them before I was even mentally capable to see them. I hadn't quite sifted through reality and nightmare. It was all still together. And so when they did come to see me, they only got to see half of me. And it was really weird for them. But luckily, they never saw me while I was in the coma. They never saw the severity of it. And they didn't have to process that until later, which I'm very grateful for. Once I started to heal though, I am one very determined puppy and I started healing fast. Nurses actually had to tell me to slow down. They said, yeah, normally we have to encourage our patients, come on, do your exercises. I did everything and I wasn't hungry. I ate everything. I wasn't thirsty. Okay, okay I was always thirsty, let's be honest. But everything that I could possibly do, I did because I was determined to get back. And I honestly thought I was going to recover 100%, if not more. And when they said to me, probably only ever regain about 80% capacity. No, no, no. Percentages are based on lows and highs and I'm clearly gonna be in the high. And I believe that for two years, as I struggled to get stronger and stronger, until finally I mentally broke and realized that this might be it. It doesn't mean I've given up and I'm still pushing. But finally reality set in. I have a disability and it's an invisible one. People only ever see it if they hear me. You know, right now my voice doesn't sound too bad, but as I get more and more tired, I honestly, I sound like I've been smoking for about 150 years and I've never smoked in my life. My ARDS was so extreme that they don't even have rehab for it because most people don't survive. So as soon as I started to recover, they whipped me up out of ICU and into the recovery units. I lasted for about a day and they already had a place for me back in my home hospital, not the hometown hospital, but the one that it belonged to. Because of course they needed the beds. So I got shipped over there for again another day before finally an opening in our own hometown hospital was available for me. And that was one of the happiest moments of my life because that meant that as my kids walked home from school, they walked right past the hospital and they could pop in and they would sit on my bed and we'd talk about the day and help them with their homework and I could just have my cuddles and my hugs and I swear I healed so much faster having my kids there with me. I remember when I was still recovering back in the ICU, there was a snow day. I was so excited. I called my girlfriend. I'm like, Cindy, you've got to get the kids. Bring them up here because they have a snow day. Like I was looking at the report way before they were even awake to see if it was a snow day because I wanted to see them so badly. I am so blessed with everybody around me. If you'd like to know what it's like being in a coma, then make sure you check out my playlist and also to hear what my dreams were like because very interesting. All of this, all these videos that I'm doing for this series are in dedication of a woman who really inspired me, Claire Wineland, who passed away sadly last summer, <sighs> suffering from cystic fibrosis her entire life, had a lung transplant, and then developed a blood clot to support her foundation, Claire's Place Foundation, which is an amazing foundation to help support cystic fibrosis families with financial aid that they otherwise don't have access to. And the most amazing part is that Claire came up with this concept when she was just 13 years old after being in a two week coma herself. So make sure you check out my dreams because I'm going to share how a lot of my dreams were not only my experiences and my fears, but also the things that were said around me, how they came into my dreams as well. 
People in a coma really do hear you. It's not that we remember hearing you, but you penetrate the walls of our brain. And it's very interesting. All right, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you'll know when my next video comes out. Thank you, and check the description below to learn more about Claire and her Claire's Place Foundation.